we know because it's the nine days in between Rosh Chodesh Av, the new moon of Av, and Tish above, the nine days. We are not doing any music shows, but we're doing interview with great musicians. And we have no exception tonight. We have a great musician, a legendary keyboard player oh, and yes. musician joining us. He has been on Schlockrock albums. We will talk about that. He has played Schlockrock shows. We will talk about that. And, of course, he's got a life outside of Schlockrock. Isn't that right, Brian? That's hard to believe, but, yeah, a small one. But, you know. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the studio, the Four Corners Project studio here in Beit Shemesh, Israel. Brian Gelfand. Thank you, uh, Lenny. Thanks for having me. Oh, all right. This is exciting. It's a pleasure. It is a pleasure to have you. And, um, you know... We have been, th this show, Lenny Salmon Live, has been going since last June 22nd. Because okay. of COVID, I had so much work, I had to find things to do with my time. I and so Lenny. we reinvented to Lenny <laughs> Solomon Live. <laughs> and this is our 129th show. It's an unbelievable, it's our second That's year. That's my new lucky number. I'm, 129, I'm right? I'm, I'm 129. Yeah. So, you know, what so always people you know lately people have been asking me so is is the is it picking up is it picking up and i look at them i'm going do you see any concerts coming back at all <laughs> they go, i don't know i don't know like th that wall behind you should you know is not a as full of flyers for concerts that i would like to see but yeah well I'm you know sure what the flyers are all in my mother's apartment in kew gardens I don't know if, I if i brought them back we could definitely <laughs> Blaster, but we really do need a new set come to think of it <laughs> and by the way today ladies and gentlemen is the florida panthers night every night i wear a different hockey jersey i was wondering you know just to was. make things interesting this yes. is the florida panthers night we are in florida we are not really we are in Beit Shemesh, israel but um Close anyway enough. brian it's let's we have a great great show planned we have to talk about you and your musical contribution to jewish music which believe it or not is is something that <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's something that really you have made an impact on Jewish music. And people are going to say, well, what impact has he made? And that's what we're going to discuss today. Let's start okay, I'm, with... I, I can't wait to find out. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, that's why I've done Don't my research. Me. I've that's done my good. research. Okay. So let's talk about, first thing is your musical background and how you became a piano player, where you ah. grew up and all that stuff. All that stuff you want. All right. All the nitty gritty. Well... I was born, uh, I'm from Long Island. I'm a Long Island boy. Uh, I'm playing view Long Island and uh, pretty much the usual. I went to, I went to uh, the Hebrew Academy in Nassau County. From Otherwise known as Hank. Hank, went to Hank, for those, you know. Um, and I just gravitated to the piano as a kid. Uh, How, my when, when was your first lesson? How old were you? I must have been around six or seven, something like that. I think I want, I remember I wanted to start earlier. I remember it was like the, you know, it was kind of a usual story. You know, you, you're my, I had two older sisters and my sisters would play. And so we had a piano and my grandmother had a piano and um, I just kind of liked, uh, I was into it. So I would just kind of gravitate towards it, begged for lessons. I think and my parents were a little reluctant. I think, you know, these days, you know, like, you know, people who are, you know, kids in the womb, We'll start with piano lessons, you know, like parents it's are too jumping early. right on it. It's my, too early, yeah. right? <laughs> my parents. I so were... I started when I was eight years old. My first lesson accordion, March 1969. I remember it. I remember March oh, wow. 1969. My father taking me and my brother to my accordion teacher for our first lesson, and we went for ten years. We would go every Sunday. You played accordion for ten years? Yeah, from eight to eighteen. Oh, well, I didn't know that. I actually, I just got an accordion. Um, someone, my neighbor gave me, it's sitting right back there. I, my neighbor gave me, and I, I've always wanted to play. So perhaps when. Great instrument. When Great I see instrument. you. Uh, well, yes. yeah, I remember in, in second grade, we had a, a, a rabbi who, as a treat, Rabbi Hush Hush, he would bring the accordion and he would play. <laughs> Why was he called Rabbi Hush Hush? <laughs> that was his really? name, Hush Hush. I remember, how, maybe maybe that was like a stage name. <laughs> Because they did fire him, I, <laughs> I, I, I never heard of such a thing. Rabbi Hush Hush, yeah. 
Anyway, uh, oh my but the, the one oh. good thing about him was he did play the accordion. I was kind of into that. Well, I got to tell you something. If we get nothing out of this interview, Rabbi Hush Hush is a great, great story. Yes, Rabbi Hush Hush. Yes. So I, everybody was playing accordion in the late 60s. 69, me and all my friends took accordion lessons. And then it became a little bit of a joke of an instrument. And when I was 15, I started taking piano lessons. And I took classical piano for three years. So now when did you, you really played pia classical piano, didn't you? I did, but I, you know, I, a lot of people think who know me now, like think, oh, you must have started like classical. I mean, I did have classical lessons, but I wasn't really that into it. I, I, I actually had a very hard time reading the notes, uh, reading off the page. And I yeah. actually put in a lot of time since then, since, but it was late in the game when I actually became like a kind of a fluent reader. I was, it was after grad school when I realized if I really wanted to do what I wanted to do, I had to get that down. But in a high school or an elementary school, I was actually, I became like an improviser. I kind of figured out, I was like, what are these letters above the, you know, chords? And I kind of figured out and I'd start playing by ear and so my teachers would help funny. me a little bit. You yeah. and, a, and, a, and a fellow Long Islander, Billy Joel, have the same thing in common because Billy Joel, when he was taking lessons and during the week he was supposed to be practicing and he would actually be improvising new classical music. And his mother thinks, oh, he's, he's practicing the pieces. He's practicing. And then when the teacher would come for a lesson, couldn't play the pieces. Right. Right. And uh, so you and Billy Joel have that in common. We have Long Island, right? He actually, right? later on, when I became a fan, I was very enthused to know he grew up just a couple miles, you know, Hicksville, Long Island. He, he, he used to box. He used to do boxing matches, I found out, in the shopping mall that me and my friends would buy records in. So it's, we is, may have that unbelievable? passed each other in the Island Shopping Plaza. So, yeah, and it was pretty cool. It's really it's really something else. So, okay, so you're, you're a piano player. Yeah. And did you when's the first time you joined the band i didn't join a band until college really i didn't you know i was like the i didn't have any music friends as kids you know it's not like i think kids today are more luck luckier and i think actually in particularly in jewish schools there was nothing you know i was the music program <laughs> right and hank um I remember, right. you know, we had Mr. Seymour Silbermans. Maybe you've heard of him. He was the I teacher. I had him too. He was an institution. He would go around all the schools yes. and he would teach. And um, he taught me a few things. He was actually, I turned out, he, it turns out he was a Juilliard. He was like a serious musician. I didn't really know that at the time. Um, but I, you uh, know what? I'll tell you something that Seymour Silbermans had over all the other music teachers in schools that I learned from, which is that. Nobody made fun of Seymour Silverman's when I when I was going to school. They yeah. gave him respect. Oh, On the other not, hand, when I was in MTA, yeah. Oh my God, the things they they did to those music teachers that made me say I will never be a music teacher. I mean, it, 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 it was <laughs> it was so awful. They would throw things. They would throw oh. things. I have to tell you, Hank, they weren't. I mean, it wasn't horrible, but I remember I was the only one who wanted to go. I remember I put I I was my first act of uh, you know social disobedience. I. Uh, I, I needed speech lessons as a kid, um, and they scheduled them. They didn't want to take me out of, you know, math or Gamora, whatever they were teaching me. So and they would take me out of music, and I said, I'm, I'm not going. Like, I refused. I put my foot down and said, I'm not leaving Mr. Silberman's. I'm not going. I'm not, I'm not ba bailing on music class. So he was so, great. You um, know, he, pa he only passed I, away recently. I mean, right, I don't not know. Not that what, long ago. Right, not that long ago. I can't re remember how much recently is it could be 10 years right. it, it could, could be, be 10 five years, years but but he was you know if he was teaching us as kids he was definitely up there in age yeah but yeah i was um and we had great guy. times with him i had great times with him i had great experience with him now okay so when did you join the band that you really that you joined that i know you you from? know <laughs> that's the band that's it mark skyer kabbalah kabbalah um, when did you join them what year well, let's see. I graduated from Hank, I think in 84, perhaps, something like that. And then uh, it was the next year when I went to Queens College for one year. And I, um, I, a lot of my friends from Hank, I remember they went to Stern and college, right? The Women's College for YU. And I went and I visited them at whatever that Brookdale Hall or whatever dorm that was. And yeah. I was playing in the lobby and Mark happened to be visiting his, Mark Skyer happened to be visiting his sister at that same dorm. And right. uh, he, he heard me playing in that lounge there. And uh, that was it. That was my first time. I, I'd never been in a band. There was no one to be in a band with, you know, when I was growing up. Isn't that so. funny? You know, I, 
it's it's really unbelievable. You know, I'll tell you what's also interesting is when I went to MTA, my senior year, I took music with Dr. Levy. Dr. Levy was the entire music department of OIU, and it was right. one of the reasons that I went to Queens College because Queens College was the Aaron Copeland School, school of, of Music, music. great school, and it was unbelievable. I was just what a great experience I had in Queens yeah. College, but and I I had a good year with Dr. Levy, but he was the entire faculty. Right, the yeah, they had Bartholomew too, or whatever. But it was, uh, yeah, he was pretty much it. Um, I know we we have a, a guitarist friend in common who told me about him. So yes, um, right, yeah. Oh, so. a guitarist friend in common, right? Yes, that's right. <laughs> We can mention him, Mo Shapiro. Mo Shapiro, used, Mo Shapiro ha took Dr. Levy for for. So, so wait a minute. So, which college did you go to? I only went to Queens College for a year, um, and then I transferred. I transferred to uh, Columbia and JTS. I went to a joint program with Columbia University and the Jewish Theological Seminary. So, and I did got, you go for music at Columbia? Yes, I did. I went for music at Columbia. And how was um, that? How what was that? I have to tell you, it was it was um, it was fine. It was very academic. I I would have had a better musical experience if I stayed at Queens College by far. You would have. I had the greatest yeah. time. I, I eight semesters in Queens College chorus with Dr. Robert White as the as the choir director. I mean, oh. I actually called him up uh, when he was eighty five years old. It was just a couple of years ago, and I thanked him. I said it was the greatest eight semesters i ever spent do, doing chorus go, being in chorus there and learning theory and sight singing and, right. and then conducting i mean they i just didn't major in it i majored in accounting right, right. so know. i did the same thing it was the same thing i had this you know i didn't have i wasn't in chorus but i actually but when i was at queen's college i was in the glee club which was like the mini chorus or something with uh rosenblum or something like that it was great um he's still right. he's still around i see him Conducting. Lawrence, Lawrence, um, was his first name Lawrence? Rosen, mm, Rosenberg, wasn't it Rosen? I don't, I don't remember. Know. Anyway, so, okay, so you're now joining Kabbalah. Now, Kabbalah yes. had put out their first album. Yes. And they parted ways with their keyboard player, and you became Correct. a keyboard player. Yes. Now, and I on the Kabbalah 2, no, the reason I've been looking Kabbalah to classic. my left is because I actually did prep work, and I got Kabbalah 1 and Kabbalah 2 to show the camera. Uh, I gotta see if I can find it. I think I see it. One minute. I go off camera. Those were good yes. records. I got it. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So here it is. This is Kabbalah One. Yes. You get the camera. Get and they had, the you camera. know, that had they had just finished that. Very when you joined soon. the band. When I joined, they hadn't even like really, you know, performed, you know sold any car you know I, I think it had just come out and they i had, was an investor in kabbalah one you know and that at the time you know making a record was a expensive uh it really venture. was so here's kabbalah two kabbalah classic it's called kabbalah classic i remember that car is from a ad yes. so that mark skyer cut out of a magazine and, you're, and uh, you have a song that you wrote yachad you yes. wrote a song on it called yachad now yes. i want to ask you about that song it's a fantastic song one of my favorite uh, songs on that album Oh, thank you. But it, it's. Do you realize that Yachad is from Nusach Svard? It's from. It's not Ashkenaz. <laughs> yes. So how did you pick? How did I pick those lyrics? I have to tell you, I still remember. I was like, first of all, that's the first song I wrote. You know, I was basically on assignment. I, I wasn't really a songwriter. I, I have to tell you, I owe Mark Skyer a lot, right? <laughs> because um, I'd never been in a you. band. Yeah, I'd never been in a band. And he put me in a band, right? I had never really, I would played around a little bit. I'd never really written songs, but I knew I wanted to like get into the songwriting thing. So I cranked out that song for that. That was the first thing I ever really wrote. Um, and um, I remember how I picked those words. I had a Shlomo Karlbach book sitting in front of me on the piano. Oh, and he has yachad, yachad, yeah, he had, yachad, he had, you know, yachad. he had words, um, you know, he used that text. And I was like, instead of looking in a sitter, I basically just flipped through the book and he had all kinds of psukim that were, you know, he had set to music. And I was like, okay, this one's fine. <laughs> and I just used that. Um, it's such a great song. And I wish I could, if I was tech savvy, what I would do right now is play it. Right. On, but uh, but I'm not tech savvy, and 
it's it's too much for me. You know, just finding okay. the cassettes was <laughs> working. <laughs> That's a don't push. Yourself. Ladies and That's gentlemen funny. of the jury, all listeners, do you know that this is a cassette? This is Does a, anybody yes, know what these are used for? By the way, that the cassette is really in inside that little box. It, that's not really even the cassette. That's correct. Let's take it out to show. Let's like show and tell, Mr. Have Rogers. A, that's an actual Ooh. tape deck back back there, right there. Ooh, that yes, I see would it. go into that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, it's funny because now we could. We used to do it with beta H beta beta track beta eight tracks. You know, my friend used to have a car and we would drive oh, around. Track, yeah, eight track Billy Joel, The Stranger, on beta track, and it was really funny. Um, anyway, okay. So and on that song, Gershon Varoba on yeah. um, sings. He did the background vocals with me. I mean, he, he, yeah, he arranged them and everything, and we sang. That's a great. It's one of my favorite songs. Ah, well, I appreciate it. I remember that. Like, uh, I remember trying to. Yeah, basically. So that was yet another thing that Mark Skyer pushed me into. Um, he, you know, Mark he taught me Skyer how to play in a band. A, he was definitely a pioneer, and I'll tell you why. Because what he was doing with Kabbalah, nobody did. Nobody did that stuff. Uh, that's did. true. I <laughs> think. <laughs> well, he's a real right? stylist. He actually he took what he really likes, and he really uh, kind of studied what he liked, and uh, was able to kind of write songs that had. You know, very identifiable structures like that. You could like say, "Oh, I, I know who." Like he could he could write like a Beatles esque song, and you'd be like, "Yeah, the Beatles could have written that." Um, so Judy Hertzfeld, our associate producer from Clifton, New Jersey, she she writes Judy in, Hertzfeld. Yeah, she says, "Did you mention Kabbalah? This was one of my favorite Jewish album Albums, tapes. tapes. A, a real, real fave. fave of mine. It's hard for me to read back here. You know, I got to get one of those big screens where the but then again, that that would be tech. You know, you know, <laughs> there's a limit. Okay, so it's very, very interesting. Now, you played with Kabbalah, and yeah. then you played with Schlagrock. I did. Well, I think I met you through them. I think you had to have. You had yeah. to have. And I remember so you, actually. You were I there remember Simcha Kagan. You were in Kabbalah. Simcha Kagan's yeah. on drums. Mark's yes. on bass. You're on keys. Yes, and we we had uh, Izzy Botnick. Who was a great, right. great young guitar player? Right. Um, the name of the guest, Judy, is Brian Gelfand. Right. Hi, Judy. We have Brian Gelfand, keyboard extraordinaire, extraordinaire, who, who has been playing, who has played a numerous Schlockrock albums, Schlock albums, as well as Schlockrock concerts, and he's also played with us in Israel. He's also played with us in. Do you remember when you played with us in Israel? I think so. I don't remember. Okay, let me let me tell you who's in the band. Shmuel Wasserman, Oliver Shalom, was on drums. I can't believe he's gone. Avrami yeah. Weisberger was on second piano. Jonathan Rimberg was on guitar or on first piano. And I was playing keyboard. And then we you were in the audience. It was at the Ramada Renaissance, 1991. The Ramada <laughs> Renaissance in the summer, right after Tisha B'Av, And you came up and... Did a guest set with us? Get a couple of guest songs. Oh, I don't even remember that. No recollection, huh? It's gone. That means you know? you've done a lot of. <laughs> means you've done a, a lot, lot of drugs. shows in your life. Uh, yeah. Now um, we have some great schlock rock memories, but let's first start. The first appearance of Brian Gelfand on a schlock rock album was yes. Shire Boker when you did the solo. For Biado, you remember Biado? Oh yes, I remember that. That was a squeeze. Homage. Yes. It was a squeeze. <laughs> it was a squeeze song for another nail in my heart. Yeah. Right. Um, interestingly, I just did a. I think I mentioned to you. I did a songwriting class online with Chris Difford, who is the lyricist from Squeeze, and which the, is uh, unbelievable to me. Um, that, that you actually it, did. You actually pretty get a cool. chance to talk to him. Oh yeah. On, like we were zooming. It was basically me, him, and. 10 other faces and little boxes on the screen. And we, you know, he'd be like, hello, Brian. Good morning. How are you? And he was sitting in his home in England and he was, <laughs> you know, whatever six hour time difference or whatever it is. And uh, he, you know, listened to my songs and he was, I mean, it was great. It was really very cool. He's it was nice everybody too. by their piano or by the guitar and they would play and sing. Is that what would happen? Uh, 
kind of, he, he gave us a lot of like our own assignments. Like we didn't really sit there and play. Well, some people did. I did a little bit. And, but for a lot of the assignments, basically he's like, okay, here's your assignment, write a song. And then we're coming back in five hours. And then, but, and because he did it that way, I often just, I did a little demo in my little home studio here. So often so I would you just know, people play that would give People would give to have a writing clinic with, 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 with one of the squeeze writers, ladies That's and gentlemen, you that don't know squeeze is my favorite band of the 1980s. The English band, my favorite band. Yeah, they're great. Really they're great. They're, and they're still going, still going, it's cranking out good music. Now, so. believe it or not, we're already 20 minutes into this interview oh, and I God. haven't done no paperwork. Oh. So let me just let All me right, just do ahead. a little bit of paperwork. Number do one is thing. if you're watching from Facebook, make sure to give us a thumbs up. Leave a comment. If you're watching from uh, YouTube, the Schlock Rock channel or the Four Corners Project channel, make sure you subscribe. Hit the bell so that you get notified every time we have a new uh, whatever. And also leave a good comment. We've been getting some great comments lately. LinkedIn, if you're watching from LinkedIn, make sure to send me a, a comment. I've, we've got, um, we've been getting a lot of LinkedIn people lately. And also Twitter, if you're watching, at Lenny Solomon. So we're going to eight channels, Brian. This is unbelievable. We actually average around 1,000 views wow. a night. That's now, it amazing. doesn't start off that way. It starts off with around 15 or 20 while we're going live, at least right. that I can see. But then mm -hmm. by the time the morning comes around, we're at 300, and then... And then after a week, we're close to a thousand views. Yona it's Lloyd right. is here. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Yona Lloyd! I remember now. Yona Lloyd, I think he was one of my connections to you because I remember him coming to my apartment. I, this was like my first schlock rock thing um, in in Queens when I so I was still in Queens College, um, and uh, kind of like kind of like uh, helping me prepare for you know i started getting into the ncsy racket through kabbalah and through right right rock all right. of that so it's oh, hi yona so, thanks uh, yeah so yona says yona says brian is the best and um oh steve ettinger steve ettinger says hi yona <laughs> hi yona there you go yeah <laughs> steve it's good to see you it's good to see you here on lenny solomon live so um it's really oh and one more thing and then we'll get back to our interview i just want to tell everybody make sure you go to the four corners project that org leave a donation for the year make a donation for the year so that we can continue our work 120 sh shows a year i'm not sure we're going back on the road brian i think that uh maybe this is it. We, i like this better <laughs> i'm from my house i don't have to go anywhere that's right yeah packing is a lot easier but to tell right. everybody tomorrow night thursday night 10 p.m israel time 3 p.m east coast we have jonathan rimberg coming Woo! into the studio for an interview he's an institution so, and yes. then he really is unbelievable and then next monday night we're back to live music after tish above monday night another show show number 131 musical It'll be a extravaganza, as they say, an extravaganza. Ah, All right. Amazing. So, Brian, I want to know if you remember this scene. We're okay. in Connecticut. The band is in Connecticut. I'm pretty sure Mo Shapiro's on the band I, I, stand. I already know what this scene is. <laughs> and our it drummer, to do with Roy, Roy Weinberger, Weinberger <laughs> gets stuck yes, in traffic. And when I say yeah. stuck in traffic, he was stuck in traffic. Yes. And he never made it to the gig until the second half of the gig and there was one person that played drums. You played drums from your keyboard. Do you from remember that show? I, I do remember it. It was actually, it was very lucky, I guess, because, like, you know, you didn't always have two keyboard players on your show. And I remember this one you had me on, which I was very grateful for. And I ended up, instead of playing keyboard, I played drums, the drum sounds on the keyboard, which I had I do a lot because I do a lot of studio production and whatever. So I program drums. So I was kind of used to that. And um, that was totally fun. I remember that. And, and I remember it was crazy because we were delaying going on, waiting for Roy. And I said, okay, I'm, I can do, you know, and then we were just going to go on because, you know, you had hundreds of people sitting there. Yeah. And uh, I yeah. started playing the drums. And then you really got into it. And then I remember halfway through the show, you go like, he's <laughs> I still remember this. You go, drum solo. <laughs> and I'm like, oh man, you know, like we're we're getting by here. Don't, you know, don't push your luck, Lenny. <laughs> and I did I gave you a drum solo. Gave you a drum solo. Oh, it was very funny. It was god. on rhythm of the night, that I think. And I was crazy. like, oh god. That's a crazy story. That's <laughs> so, only I could do something as yeah, crazy as it was as funny. That. 
Because, um, ladies and gentlemen, Brian was playing drums on his keyboard. You have to right, picture yeah. it. Our drummer, he finally showed up. He got stuck in traffic. And then he said, Lenny, should I set up? I said, yeah. no, no, we I got mean, it covered. Right. It was like basically like I was just doing this. On, like, right. I knew what each of the keys, you know, this is a snare drum and this is a kick drum. And I, I played. You know, it was yes. totally, I, actually, I totally loved it. I, I do that occasionally on like. And it was in Connecticut. I can't remember fun. the community. It could have been remember. Westport. It could have been Westport, Connecticut. But yes, want to was... show them? You have a drum sample that you could show I, them? I don't right now. Honestly. Okay, so, so forget yeah. that. So, yeah. all right. So first thing is you played. Yeah. So you played on the Shire Boker album, the solo of Biado, which yes. is a squeeze takeoff of um right another nail in my heart right yes and then the next time you played with us i believe was in mikdash where you played the piano accompaniment for oh, that was a beautiful song. yeah i remember that it was a beautiful song and you played it yeah. amazingly and we had and, no and other instruments it was just I remember you and me. it was mick cantarella's studio i remember that yes um in brooklyn and uh yeah it was great and you did all these beautiful vocals on it. i remember it was yeah it was really nice yeah so. it was a great great thing and then um i'm trying to remember if you appeared on any other albums we did sure. a, we did some production work together yes uh where and i then brought I, and i was on the cover of uh, sergeant schlockers that's right you were on the cover of i was holding an accordion history tour and you're playing accordion I mean, I was holding 19. an accordion. I was holding. Well, that was my accordion. <laughs> that would have been 1991. So, yeah, that would have been 1991. So, so now, when did I could probably look at the back and tell me when did the Brian Gelfan solo album come out? Well, so when I was in college at ATS, I started my own band called Bot Cole, right? With um, a bunch of guys, and I it was heavily inspired by Mark Skyer because he basically taught me how to you know put a, put a band together. So right. um, I had a band, and I was like the main songwriter and uh, vocalist and keyboard player. And I had a bunch of guys, and uh, this guy David Levine was a drummer, and Ross Singer was a guitar player, we got a bass player uh, David Park, and um, we put out a record d during college, and uh, a. So um, I did that, and then I went to grad school. I went to New England Conservatory. And when I went to New England Conservatory, I got a couple commissions from some, like, Camp Vermont to write all these songs, and I did another album kind of on my own. And I took from both of those things and uh, redid some of the songs that I'd done, and I stuck it on that cassette that you just held up. That was, so that's like a compilation of kind of my own you know, spanning over seven or eight years. So Jewish we're, we're going to focus. It's amazing. We're going to focus on the last two things of, because we are already 28 yeah, minutes Yeah, see, we're almost done. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Well, we, we'll, we'll go a little bit longer if you have time, but I, got, I just I got wanna, time. let's yep. talk about two things. One yep. is you became a choral director. Yes. And you've been at a lot of schools. You've been at Flatbush, Yeshiva Flatbush. Yes. Right. I was there for 12 years. Yep. Right. So tell, tell the audience what you've done musically, uh, especially with chorus and with choral music? Uh, I started, I, I started fresh actually. That was one of my first choral jobs. Um, and uh, I started becoming interested in vocal arranging. So um, they wanted a choir director at fresh um, and that combined with there's this great guy daniel henkin you know daniel henkin yeah he's brilliant he's, he's great brilliant. so he is I, i'd have to say mark skyer and dan henkin <laughs> i owe a lot of my career to those two gentlemen right because they both oh i like the i like the change of uh you like that I, camera I, switch I like that. it's like now Ooh, we're moving to dan tech, henkin. very tech very nice um so dan henkin actually he pushed me in a different direction um, he asked me to engineer and do the, all the backing tracks for his, some of his choral albums. 
at Solomon Schechter. So I started doing that. So I started like uh, doing like recording and the recording thing I got into because Mark Skyer had pushed me into like recording, f doing the arrangements from Rabbi Mikhail Torsky. I did a right, rhyme, which right. was kind of crazy, but like, so anyway, so, and but through that, I was like, oh, I like the being involved with choirs and stuff. I started doing some arranging and then Daniel Henkin, when he left Fatwish to go exclusively to Ramaz, he said, do you want, are you interested in this job? So I took it and I started arranging, you know, for choirs pretty much when I got there. And it's amazing. Um, isn't it an amazing thing to do? I, it's something that I, I loved would it. love yeah. to do. I would love yeah. to do it. I, I've never done it. I mean, I've done it in the studio, obviously, right. when, yeah. you know, okay, you sing this part, you sing this part, right? but there was nothing like Queens College when, when we were 120 voices and you had Dr. Robert White go bass, tenor, alto, soprano, and then everybody yeah. would, and he would just take us through our, our warm-ups and then into, right. and we did, we did recitals with him. I did Beethoven's Ninth with him with a full oh, wow. orchestra, first semester, but um, so, so you've been involved in that. Are you teaching anywhere now? Um, so, uh, currently I am at the Kinneret Day School in Riverdale. Um, so I do acquire there. That's actually, that's a, but they're young. They're like, that's elementary school. Right. Uh, different, so different game. It's a different Boy. thing. Right. Um, so I have to say like, I, I loved my time at Flatbush um, I left because the commute was just, I, I live now in Westchester and it was becoming, it was too hard to get, to it Brooklyn. was too hard to get there. Um, but, uh, I do miss, um, I miss conducting a high school chorus, um, and arranging for a high school chorus. It was great. Wow. Really great. So, and did, did you end up getting your master's in music by the way? Yes, I did. I got Where a master's from, from the new England conservatory in Boston, Massachusetts. So you Wait, so wait, what happened to Juilliard? Juilliard never happened, or I never went to Juilliard. I st I, I, I took father, I took some, I took some piano lessons. My father there, wanted me to go to Juilliard, and I of course I went to Queens College. But you right. went from from Queens College to Columbia, and yeah. then you went to the New England Conservatory, and you got your master's yes. there. Yes. Was that uh, was that amazing? Or was it a was it fun? Uh, it was. I mean, it was amazing. It was like uh, I have to say, I was like um, it was hard. Uh, cause I was very, um, behind when I got there because, you know, a lot of the people that I was in a master's program with, you know, like I went to Columbia, as I said, and I was doing like, it was an academic thing and I ha was taking classical piano lessons kind of on the side. Um, but a lot of these people had been, you know, in a master's program, they went to a conservatory undergrad, you know, right. they'd been like hitting it so hard it's like for a long were time. If you if we if we use the yeshiva comparison, they were in yeshiva, then they went to base medrash, then they went to yes. kolel. You had to yeah. jump to the musical kolel. I jumped to the kolel, but yeshiva or base yeah. medrash, correct. Right? So I always felt like you know, and it's weird. It's like you go you go to masters, masters was only two years. You know, um, it's like nothing. It flies by. It's four semesters. It's nothing. So right. it taught me a lot about like oh, what I'd like to learn. <laughs> so I gathered right. a lot of stuff and um, I still, I think because of that kind of what I always regard as a late start, I still take lessons. I still, I have two teachers. I have a jazz teacher and I have a classical piano teacher. So I'm 52. Um, you know, I'm still Brian, studying. You look, you look 26. <laughs> oh, well, that's kind, but I'm not. I, I look um, 26. You do. That's because of the hockey jersey. The hockey jersey makes you look young. I, That's I'm, the secret I, of the hockey I'm, jersey. As soon as we get off, I'm ordering a hockey jersey. <laughs> <laughs> now listen, Brian. The, for, our, so. for our last, for what I want to, what I want to talk about last is, yeah. your, I know that you've written musicals, or, yeah. well, yeah. you kind of have. You, I, you had told me you were, or maybe you were in the middle of writing it. Um, I, we had you know, I wrote a couple of, like musical. Yeah, I mostly a songwriter. You know, I've written, you know, I've written music for other people's shows, incidental music, some isolated songs, stuff like that. So, um, right. But, yeah. What is it that you, if I would say to you, I know that you play now club, you obviously do club dates with, uh, yeah. with sometimes with Jonathan Rimberg, with enough Shane yes. who writes sometimes mm -hmm. with, um, Yitzi Spinner. Um, uh, okay. That's nice. So, uh, Ellie Katz, certainly. Oh, very good. Yeah. So um, what, if I would say to you, Brian, Pick what is it? Where do you want to go from here musically? Where do you see yourself in the next five to seven years? What would you What would you say? 
That's an interesting question, which I talk, I think about a lot. Uh, I'm pulled in so many different directions because I study all these different things. Like I don't want to be a classical recitalist, even though I do play a lot of classical music. Um, I don't really picture myself as like a jazzer, like playing jazz clubs, you know, even though I study a lot of jazz. <laughs> but I would like to, um, I, I but I love doing all of that. I definitely want that part of my life. Um, and I would say where I'd like to be in the next couple of years is uh, doing more of my own original music and kind of incorporating a lot of right. I agree. that stuff into I it. Agree. So totally. I've been doing that actually over the pandemic. It's actually been, uh, it's been one of the few bright sides of the pandemic is it's pushed me to do more of that. So It's a funny thing because people, people are still sending me parody ideas and I, oh, yeah. I don't, I don't know how to break it to them, but. I'm like way past there right now. I don't want to do parodies anymore, um, right. but it's just the way it is. You know, I, once, once you're stereotyped, you're stereotyped. Luckily right. you have not been stereotyped. You have the, the future ahead of you. You, you, you know, maybe we'll both get to do, well, first thing is for me, Daniel and Babylon is I a key. I, I, I got to get Daniel and Babylon out there. Yeah. Um, definitely. And it just takes, well, the, besides the fact that Broadway and, and uh, theater has been closed for the last year and a half. And I don't think it's opening up so soon, even though they say it'll be open by this September. I just. I don't know. I know people who are playing on Broadway and they are, say they're, they're scheduled to go back. So. So maybe it'll happen. We'll see. Depends you know? if they lock us down with another variant, but. That's uh, possible. Yeah. Uh, you I know, know before they... we end, I, you know, I, I do want to thank you because you have always been uh, very gracious to me. Um, and, uh, I've been very grateful to, you know, as I've, I always try to like, you know, be, I am very grateful to, you know, as I mentioned, Mark Skyer and Daniel Hankin, you know, and Seymour Silbermans and Gershon Varoba and like, you know, all these people who I, I really, really, um, really helped me do what I love. Um, and I'm very grateful to you it's the, and them. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, all I could say is that it's been a pleasure and we had such great times together and hopefully yeah. we'll, ha hopefully we'll, we'll have, have more. more times together. Yes. Yeah, totally. And uh, maybe even one day we'll get Mo Shapiro to come on for, for a half hour. From your mouth. <laughs> I'm hoping, I'm hoping. But in the we meantime, uh, we did get to talk about him a little bit. And, yeah, uh, we did. He was part of Schlockrock 2.0, as you were. You were part yeah. of Schlockrock 2.0. Yes. And um, I know, remember, I, you know, it was a Kesher. I was into Kesher. Um, yes. I remember. Kesher you were, was amazing. They were, amazing they were great. Band. And the songs were great. You know, the, yes. song, the song's really great. Were yeah. you on that the YU in '85 when why when Kabbalah played YU? Kesher was the second band, and Miami Boys is the third band. Were you had you joined the band yet by that time? It was like December '85. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure if if it may have been very close, like because that's right, kind of right around. Sometime in '86, I would. Think. Yeah, I, I think that was like right around it. where I met them. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, I want to uh, thank Brian Gelfand for coming on. Lenny Solomon Live, show number 129. And Steve Ettinger, I want to thank you for, for commenting. Judy Hertzfeld, our associate producer, Yona Lloyd. And I want to tell Steve, we I will write notes to all the things that you said to ask Jonathan Rimberg tomorrow. And believe me, Judea was one of those things. So you don't have to worry Judea. about that. Jude, Judea was one of my favorite albums. It was one of the things that inspired me to move Oh, forward. that's a great album. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Right, can't wait to hear about that one. Yeah. So um, anyway, tomorrow night, 10 p.m. Israel time, 3 p.m. New York time. We have Jonathan Rimberg in studio. Brian Galvin, I want to thank you for coming on Lenny Solomon Live. Everybody out there, have a great night, and we will see you tomorrow with show number 130. Uh, keep on schlocking, and bye have bye. a great day. Keep schlocking.